good evening everyone it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the session on future of global cooperation on ai perspectives from un high level advisory body on ai as we know the past decade has seen various existing multilateral organizations such as the g20 and brics that have incorporated ai as a key priority area recognizing this need to foster a globally inclusive approach towards ai the un secretary general convened a multi stakeholder high level advisory body on artificial intelligence to undertake analysis and advance recommendations for the international governance of ai this session convenes various members of the high level advisory body to deliberate on the future global cooperation and governance of ai and how various existing initiatives may converge towards ensuring a unified approach towards advancing trustworthy ai we have a stellar panel for the session and i look forward to an extremely insightful discussion with this i would like to invite the esteemed panel to the stage dr amandeep gill United Nations Secretary General Envoy on Technology. Dr. Renata Duan, Senior Consulting Fellow at Chatham House. Mr. Vilas Dhar, President and Trustee Patrick J. McGowan Foundation. Professor Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, UNESCO. Dr. Sedina Nadai, lecturer at Cheikh Hamida Kane Digital University. Mr. Sharad Sharma, co-founder Icebird Foundation. We will also have two virtual speakers joining us shortly. Uh, Dr. Virginia Dignam, professor of responsible artificial intelligence at Umeå University, Sweden, and Dr. Nazni Nazneen Rajani. founder and ceo of colinear ai good evening everybody um now there is the next worst thing to doing a panel after lunch is to do the last panel of the day uh when everybody is tired and you're all ready for sort of uh answering your emails and co covering all that you haven't managed to cover today so we're going to try to keep this lively engaging interactive and that means that everybody on the panel is going to speak very concisely and if we don't please wave wave your hands and i'll certainly wave mine um there are a number of members of the secretary general's high level um advisory body on ai with us on the panel today in addition to amandeep um we've also got uh, i think if i may uh, sharad charmas on a member of the panel Uh, Vilas uh, Dar is also on the panel, and to the left of Amandeep uh, Sadina Musende is on the panel. We're going to be joined for by Virginia Dynam, uh, uh, who brings up the gender quota on that panel. And I do want to reassure you, the gender quota is good. Um, exactly, and Nazim, who will join us uh, from Hugging Face, is is on the panel. So we're it's a good mix. and this is an opportunity for you to hear a little bit about the panel uh we may not have time for questions but if there's something super urgent please wave your hands and i'll try to get that but with that before we go into a whole discussion of why the secretary general's high level body what is it doing and how does it work i'd like us just to maybe step back just a small bit and to ask why are we in the business of ai governance and why are we all working through a series of conversations about forms of ai government governance so sharad maybe just to start with you what's the need we're trying to solve ai is ai is obviously very global uh, and you know it's a very uh, funny system because we got to protect the user from bad ai right the ai that they may be using may be coming from a country separate from the one that they live in and to produce that ai they may be using data from a third country that may have come and the people who contributed that data have a right for their privacy to be preserved as they go forward and all this data would have been turned into a model in the fourth country's compute infrastructure that we are looking at and it's quite possible that the people working on it you know don't belong to the country that actually is taking the ai to the masses but they are actually located in the fifth country so it's about as global as anything can get 
and everybody in this system has something to protect. The people want to protect their data. People want to protect themselves from harms. Uh, you know, there are artists who want their copyrights to be protected. So, so there are many things that are involved here. And if we want a healthy AI ecosystem in the future, therefore we will have to cross country boundaries in many of these areas. And the only way to do that is to think about it in that way right from the beginning. So I think that is the case for looking at it from a cross-country global perspective. And colleagues, if there's something urgent that you want to add, please feel free to do so. But I'll move to you, Amandeep. Uh, October of this year, the Secretary General set up uh, this advisory body to produce recommendations. Are, what are you focused on and what do you think is the added value to these multiple initiatives on governance that we're seeing right now? I think to add to what Sharad said in terms of the global footprint of the AI value chain, AI and data value chain, uh, there are global norms uh, uh, at stake uh, from uh, human rights uh, to norms related to uh, respect for the rule of law, uh, peace and security issues. And so those are legitimate global concerns. Um, and there is an aspect of good use as well. So we focus on some of the misuse issues, some of the risks. Uh, now, we need to kind of catch up very quickly on the deficit on the sustainable development goals. We've fallen behind, and uh, AI, data, digital technologies may provide us with the needed acceleration, but you just can't harness them if you do it in a very narrow sense, within borders, and you know, with a few companies leading the charge. You need to kind of increase the scale of adoption, the scale of innovation uh, of relevance to the SDG. So what we are focused on is the larger digital cooperation piece uh, where the global digital compact to be adopted next year at the summit of the future is important. There is a protection piece in there, human rights online, misinformation, disinformation, preventing the fragmentation of the internet. There is a promotional piece in terms of the SDGs, building the global digital commons, and there is AI as well. And in the AI context, we are focused very much on support to this advisory body. Uh, 39 members, uh, 20 women, 19 men, 33 different countries, uh, all the regions across the world, all stakeholder groups, uh, very carefully balanced in a sense, also in terms of age and, and different uh, perspectives. And this is in a sense, uh, a first step in crafting a shared assessment globally of what are the risks and challenges what are the opportunities, and more importantly, the enablers uh, that are needed to realize those opportunities, and what kind of an international response we must craft going forward with all these different initiatives in mind. So how do we knit them together uh, for uh, a mutually reinforcing tapestry? And that works at these different levels, the uh, level of companies and private sector, national and regional regulatory schemes, and of course, the international accountability, international normative framework. Thanks, uh, Amandeep. I mean, there's probably many people in the room involved in some of the G20 initiatives, the G7, other processes that are on way that might say, I recognize many of the things that you say, and my entity or my process is trying to address many of these things. So. Maybe we'll just sort of zoom in a little bit on the added value of uh, a global body versus perhaps any initiative that draws on universal norms or values. And maybe uh, if I could turn to you, Sedina, this question of the shared assessment of the risks and opportunities, without sort of revealing your conclusions ahead of time, do you feel that a common picture is emerging uh, in the advisory body on what some of those shared risks and shared opportunities, and is there a balance there? No, no I, I think that um, in, the, in the body, all the, the perspectives are now aligned, I think so, because we come from two days uh, in, uh, in New York, and it was very, very interesting, very a uh, good debate, but uh, in the end, I think that we, we had 
uh, we all have uh, the same uh, the same uh, view about uh, opportunities and about uh, about um, risks. But I think that there is a little thing that we have to dig. It's about uh, how to how the global south could be more involved on in this process and uh, how to to take into account the the need of the global south, the the need to be able to build their own capacities, their own uh, models, and uh, to not to fall into the new uh, uh, the neocolonialism of uh, AI, uh, because you, uh, global south, a lot of com countries, especially in Africa, it's particular in Africa, uh, where um, there is no a culture of data, there is no culture of uh, AI, what to do with data, how to uh, build model with data and so on. So I think that we have to have a focus on this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of people so that we can talk with, uh, um, uh, with government because the problem of Africa is not the people, but it's more the government. So UN is the best place to to uh, to talk about this kind of problem and to push government to uh, focus on uh, the the opportunity of AI. So. And I think that sort of echoes and builds on Amandeep's point of why a UN and what is that framework. I think it's also good to keep the conversation also inclusive of the issues of opportunities, where quite often it the entry point is harms. Um, you know, we have been working in the UN and people and institutions like UNESCO have been at the heart of some of these these developments. Gabriella, you've been leading a lot the work on the ethics of AI. Do you have some sense of where the points of convergence are developing and what are some of the experiences that you've had that could be useful for the advisory body to build on? Well, yes, that's 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 a very good question, Renata. It's okay. Okay. Well, first and foremost, let me thank Amandip because we have been in this journey together. Amandip called on many uh, institutions uh, to chip in in terms of integrating the advisory body and also to uh, become part of his thinking inside the system uh, in terms of the recommendations. So, thank you, Amandip. I think that's uh, very welcome. I have to say that that. Uh, it's true that when the Secretary General came out with this very great concern, and I uh, commend his leadership in terms of uh, when Generative AI came in, and it was like a wake-up call because we knew that there was a gap between where the technologies were and where the systems to deal with technologies, the governance systems to deal with the technologies were, and with Generative AI and the exponential increase of their capacities, that was a big gap. And therefore, it was very legitimate to say, where are we? At the end, this also led all the institutions that are dealing with these issues to step up and show what exactly we have been doing and uh, and to see where we can link the the, the, the efforts. And, and, and it's pretty straightforward. I think that we can talk about international issues and the value chains and the, the, the way we govern these technologies need to start at the national level and need to start by having the governments with the capacities first to understand the technologies and second to shape the markets where these technologies and it's not going to be the ver the first market that governments will be shaping but it's a very complex because it's pervasive and it's touching all the sectors so i feel that this is the reflection that we are having in the sense that uh, market developments are always ahead of the game regulators are always lagging behind how do we fill that gap and how do we ensure that first we change the narrative because the narrative have been of technological competition, geopolitical issues, profit making. We change the narrative on inequalities because it's only two countries, China and the US that have 80% of these developments. Good for them, very innovative, but at the end, this creates this concentration at the top creates a, a unequal outcomes at the bottom. And we are just reproducing the very unequal world that we have through the development of these technologies, and then you have the harms that you have mentioned. So I feel that the question here is how the international community get together to deliver on this. UNESCO is contributing with, because we have the recommendation of, on the ethics of AI, 
pretty straightforward just aligning these technologies to human rights, human dignity, inclusiveness, sustainability, but then moving into policies. And then, of course, we will need to find out how do we go for the interoperability of these systems. But first and foremost, it's a question of capacities of governments to understand the technologies and shape them better. Vilar, you spend a lot of time working in and around different countries, supporting different uh, national, local, civil society processes. Is that a realistic goal for a global AI governance, that it will have a tangible capacity building dimension? Or is that something that may be difficult to frame in high level principles? What a question. Um, good evening, everyone. Um... I am really delighted to be here with a panel of experts and visionary leaders. But to answer your question, I think the first place I go is actually to reflect back on some of the remarks that the Secretary General shared with us when we were in New York just last week. He spoke quite eloquently and in a visionary way about AI, not merely as a technology, and AI governance, not merely as a question of governing a technology. But if I might put my own words into it, I think about it as really, if AI will transform human lives in the way we think it will, it's not just a question about regulating frontier models. It's a question about how do we think about conceptualizing our social, our economic, our political decision as we think about the future. AI governance gives us a particular opportunity, lets us question assumptions and think about the future. In that context, you asked me, is it a possible goal? I think on one side, let's begin with the real threat, potentially, of a fracture in how different governments and different nation states Think about those fundamental questions about what an equitable world looks like when AI enables these kinds of opportunities. And let's respond to that then, not with the heavy hammer of saying the answer is, well, we should make sure that everybody governs in the same way. I don't think that's the outcome. But in this balance of harmonization, right, of potentially thinking about how we allow for interoperability between local priorities, between an understanding of cultural context that might drive different interests, how do we name a set of norms, principles, and values that allow us to move to a global standard and a recognition about what I think of as the soul of our shared society, about what it looks like when AI transforms fundamental assumptions about socio-political situations, and ask the question as we think about the 21st century, where do we find a harmony in our values and a harmony in our approach? Now, you ask me, is that a possible goal? And you know that the answer I give you will be absolutely yes. But I'm not so naive as to assume that that's an inevitable outcome of a process. Instead, what it requires is institutions that can step forward that through a long history of trying to figure out ways to build consensus around this can bring together global. I can think of nowhere better than the United Nations to do that, not merely to have the conversation, but to offer practical and pragmatic solutions like the ones that Gabriela has spoken of that have come out of UNESCO, like the work that's happening at UNB, at other institutions. What it requires of us, though, is I think much more fundamental. Those of us who are not a part of the UN system, but are willing to support it, to say this is something that requires a public discourse and a public participation that's different from the kinds of debates we've had in the past, that require us all to share a shared sense of digital literacy, a capacity for a shared vocabulary, not merely about AI. We've all spent the last year, I know, learning about what foundation models are, what large language models are, what generative AI is. But also to think about what this means when it translates into domains, like thinking about how we shape a workforce of the future, how we think about representative participation and making sure that our educational systems are set up in ways that allow for us to have participation in these decisions. What does it mean for the distance between governments and their citizens? not merely as a matter of how do we use AI to deliver better benefits, but foundational questions of what representative participation looks like. This to me is the challenge. If you ask me if it's possible, I'd say yes, but I say it's only possible when we invest in ensuring that every person on the planet not only has the capacity to participate, but feels the agency to do so. That's a mandate that I think is a much more significant one than figuring out how we regulate the risks of the next round of AI. No, and I think you raise a really interesting uh, point, which is that, and you flagged it too, Gabriela, generative, generative AI has sparked something. It has sparked conversation outside of technical agencies and technical bodies where, where AI is not new. And it has sparked a question about literacy 
and engagement from entities that haven't usually. I just came back from Geneva and there last week, ILO has produced a report on how AI is going to work. You had WMO in the room, you had WIPO, you had a set of actors that don't all necessarily harness around the same set of technical questions asking some of those. So I think you're absolutely right. It's had that more than nudge effect, uh, push effect. Sharad, we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're not having AI governance in a vacuum. We're having it in a discussion of a century of thinking about digital or uh, technological governance and digital technology governance. We're having it in a context of discussions about data and data governance. Are there some lessons from some of these international technology governance frameworks and experiences that we can draw on? And please, colleagues, do feel free to come in. And I've been particularly struck about the emerging language around responsible behavior. And if I put on my old arms control hat, responsible behavior in space, in nuclear, in uh, cybersecurity, this is an old phrase. It's an old phrase that hasn't always delivered in terms of implementation, um, enforceability, compliance. So really like to hear your perspectives on some of the lessons. So we'll ask uh, Sigurd a thought, so I'll start with that. So I'll make three points, if I may. Uh, the first is, you know, I'll take you back to 1450s, Gutenberg Press. That revealed a fracture. Yes, there are many people said, hey, the Christianity that we read in the Bible is not the Christianity we see being practiced. Central Germany, Protestant movement, you know, big social upheaval, you know, in villages, towns, and 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 uh, uh, and cities, people could no longer, you know, it's polarized. We think there's a lot of polarization, but you go back and talk about polarization, then, you know, cities and towns, which used to be harmonious, are now divided into two tribes who are literally killing each other, and out of that has to emerge a new way of organizing society. Second, I take you to, uh, to uh, in the same theme, you know, some years later, the 17th, 50s, you have the steam engine, which lets the industrialist of that era say, hey, I don't need to hire you. I'll hire a child to do that work, right? Because, and that created its own social upheaval. And out of that, all those fractures, and this is, of course, the bridge version of what happened. You, you had Karl Marx writing the, the manifesto in, in, I think, 1848, right? At that time, you had a new conception of what it means to be a human. You know, that is the age of enlightenment that we talk about. We went uh, and we changed every kind of system that we knew. We changed the way the criminal system, the education system, everything changed. I think those 400 years are going to be compressed in 40 years. And a good outcome would be that we change what it means to be a human for the better, right? Because whether we like it or not, that is going to change. Robotics is going to change what it means to be a factory worker. AI will change what it means to be a white collar worker and more, right? So, so that's the reality that we are looking at. Now, coming to the specifics of your question, I think we have lots to learn from what we did with nuclear technology, right? There are some things that we need to learn. It took an ecosystem approach. We said, if you have to curtail this technology, we must deal with all aspects of this, you know, where you mine the uranium, where you process the uranium, where you use it, and, all, and, and how do you, you know, kind of uh, deal with uh, uh, used uranium. So the ecosystem idea is a good one. But where it fails is best captured with a quote that I used in our meeting as well, is from that famous evolutionary biologist, E.O. Wilson. Even if you don't know him, I'm sure you know his quote. He says, we have a paleolithic brain medieval institutions and godlike technology. Now, of course, he was not talking about AI. He was talking about CRISPR. But this applies to AI as much. And his second part of the quote was that since we have godlike technology, we have to rethink the institutional structure, the human structure that will curtail that technology. So I think AI is fundamentally different from nuclear technology because this is way more godlike <laughs> that nuclear technology is. And so we've got to go back and think, how are we going to bring an ecosystem approach to it? Which brings me to the third part, which is really 1st January 1983 when internet was supposedly born. 
if you google and say birthday of internet it will throw up 1st january 1983 not so far back and and really that was supposed to deliver goodies to us which were decentralization empowerment of the individual balance of power shifting in the favor of the citizen which we all know has not happened mm -hmm. and it has not happened because the multi stakeholder approach of regulating the internet is a massive failure right so to me i think we need all the three elements we need to first acknowledge we are in the place of radical change and it will end up defining what it means to be human second we must take a ecosystem approach third we must recognize that the ecosystem approach the multi stakeholder approach that we've taken so far is not going to deliver the goods so we got to invent something new and so to me those are some of the lessons that we can learn from our past which we need to bring to the present to deal with this new challenge that humanity is facing I think there'll be lots of questions around the failures of the multi-stakeholder approach that you flag. Um, but so I'm going to just nudge you a little bit that. Can you just give two concrete examples of what you see as some of the limits in multi-stakeholder? And then I'm going to put a question to the audience to think about, you know, perhaps in the Q&A, what are the alternatives and how does one strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach? Yeah. So, you know, I think the hardest change is to do with techies. See, in nuclear technology, we gave technologists the right to say, look, technology can be used for good or bad. You don't worry about it. You build the best technology that you can. And it's the role of society to amplify the good use cases and damp down the bad use. Now the technology is godlike. It cannot be handled that way. So you need a new class of technologies who are value-based technologies, who, because they are value-based technologies, choose to be restrictive with that technology where they think they are out of alignment with the values of society, and to be permissive where they think they have to be, they are in sync with the thing. So first, the society needs, like you mentioned, need to be able to state the desirable values that you want society to exhibit and then you need technologies to uh, take accountability to take responsibility for building the technology that will get us there we never asked this from the technologists so although i would say possibly the largest pool of public technologists in the world is now in bangalore in bangalore we are split between two camps one camp is the old camp which does not agree that they have a responsibility for building a value-based technology. The second camp, which as you can see, I belong to, does take this very seriously. And I think we, 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 we have friction amongst ourselves, although we love each other and respect each other for our work. And I think until this value-based technology camp becomes more powerful than it is today, no amount of multi-stakeholder work will actually deliver. Because today the technology is godlike technology is very powerful. It needs to be contained, constrained at the moment of its creation, not after it is already ready and deployed. So this is to me the hardest challenge that we have in building a multi-stakeholder approach in which these new class of technologies feel loved because they haven't been loved so far. And so you guys, how many of you are in the civil society groups? You beat us up all the time. We don't feel loved. I just want to complain. And 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 on the other side, for people like us who are really, I was telling her, really Sheldons on the inside, you know, who are not used to be here in sessions like this, have to train ourselves and be in those conversations so that together we can shape the future the way it ought to be shaped. So that's the challenge. I think it's going to be a tough challenge. I'm really struck, although you're coming from different points, how you're all, Sedina, uh, Vilar, and Sharad, making a similar point about a mindset change and about a focus on a much larger public conversation, a public education, a literacy and awareness, and then within the context of a technology mindset change that I think is, is really striking. And I'll come back to you for the last question, Amadeep, as to how the advisory boards work can facilitate or not that global uh, effort. 
but I'd like to just welcome onto the panel our two, uh, two women to get the gender balance going. So thank you very much. Uh, both of you came right at the right time or there was going to be a manal. Um, and so Anna Kissmann, um, very welcome to us from Germany, aerospace uh, coordinator of the German federal government. And with us joining remotely, uh, Virginia Dynam um, from uh, Umeå University in uh, Sweden, but also a member of the uh, high-level advisory panel. Um, I'd like to just come back to make this a conversation about some of the other initiatives and the convergence of some of the developments that are taking place. And then, Virginia, I'm going to draw you in a little bit on some aspects that we we've talked a lot about good, but let's talk about risks and ways of navigating some of those risks. Um, Anna, are you seeing a convergence, I mean, viewed from a government perspective now, uh, and Germany sits on many of them, you're in the G7, you're in the G20, you're in the OECD, the EU AI Act has just been placed, and of course, as a member of the UN, you're in tons of multi-stakeholder fora. Are you seeing, a, do you have a cognitive disson dissonance? Are you seeing a conversation where you see there is a path, and even though we're ex having multiple conversations, I see a way forward. Yes. Um, so happy to be here. Sorry for being late. It was due to the ministerial meeting, which was uh, still going on. And um, I think, first of all, it's a very good thing that we have so many initiatives right now, because it shows that also on the political side, on the side of the government, like, now everyone knows there is something important going on around AI and we have to find a common way of dealing with it uh, for the opportunities as well as for the risks. And I think there, like the last year was just astonishing how many things have been started or finalized, like the, the AI Act. And uh, this is uh, something quite new. I mean, uh, the technology is already there for a while, I'd say. But actually, this kind of focus from a governmental level, from all these different initiatives, G7, et cetera, and now the United Nations, this is quite young. So I think we, we see two sides. One, it, it took a while, and the technology is already there for a while. But now everyone has realized uh, we have to do something about it because there are so many opportunities. Um, and I think... For example, and there all the different uh, initiatives have kind of a different focus and I would say they add to each other. It's not that uh, like one would be uh, unnecessary, but I think um, all of them have a different focus and the important thing is to bring them together. But for example, for the UN advisory body, and now I don't know what you have already discussed, but um, they are having the focus on like, like the UN specific common sense like the SDGs how can AI uh, support the SDGs which is also like a framework but that we have already in the UN how uh, on the other side might they risk human rights which is also something very fundamental I think that is something that is linked to classical the UN question and it's good that we have there this broad framework on the other hand we have the GPI here discussing how we can really in deep go to the expert project, expert level, um, bringing them together um, with a political framework and, and maybe having concrete projects out of them and concrete research centers. So that is maybe also a little bit of a different focus. And so I think it's good that we have the strong focus from the political side now because it's necessary. And uh, I think all the initiatives add to each other. But of course, maybe we need a little bit more for in the future where we bring it together Maybe GPI can be something like a node in between, but that is to be seen, I think. Right, and I think that's actually one of the points that the Secretary General has flagged in establishing the AI advisory body, which is how do we ensure a coherent uh, global effort uh, in, in doing so on this. Uh, Virginia, we surprisingly, before you join us, a lot of the times the questions tend to be focused on the harms, and that has driven a lot of the conversations in our society, uh, risks and harms associated in particular with generative AI. But we managed to start today on the opportunities and some of the issues, or at least thinking about the potential. But I do want to come back to some of the risks and the, how we navigate a risk-based approach. Um, We've seen already, for example, the EU AI Act under discussion since 2018, agreed with some challenge uh, just last week. 
But just before the act started to come out in its draft act, Gen AI chatbot GPT came out. Obviously, nobody thought to tell the European parliamentarians that. But, you know, that so the technology catching up with the with the attempts to regulate and manage straight away. And now we already have criticisms or challenges saying that the US executive order is already defining frontier models at a particular level of compute power. That's going to change the framework. So I guess my question to you is, how do we frame a risk-based approach? And how do we think about risk-based approaches that keep, that are future-proof? Thank you very much and apologies for being late. Um... I think that the risk-based approach or the understanding of risk starts exactly with what I heard in the little bit that I joined. I see that there is a huge uh, accountability gap. Uh, technology is not accountable. Technology is not responsible. Technology is not godlike. We need to create the, the, the infrastructures, the social technical infrastructures, which enable us from a human, humanity and societal perspective, deal and address the risks and take the responsibility for the technology. It's The issue is not that the technology will or will not be uh, out of control. What we do need to start first by doing is to ensure that we have uh, uh, mechanisms and instruments to control those that are developed, deploying and using this type of technology. Uh, and by creating or by talking about risks is that not necessarily or definitely not and uh, going against the the possibilities or against the the innovation capabilities i often give the example of a car uh, a yeah, it can be compared with a car without brakes. There, there is no no brakes or no seat belts, or at least no regulations which requires that the the car has brakes and seat belts. And without those brakes and seat belts, no one would dare to use the car. So if we want to benefit from the potentials of AI, we need to make sure that we are start talking about what are the brakes, what are the seat belts that we want to put there, and that is opposite or it's. It's not it's orthogonal to the capabilities of this technology is not limiting the, the, the capabilities of the technology, but it's ensuring that there is regulation that says before you put it into the market, before you start using it, before you make it available for others, you can you need to take these issues into account. And that's where I think that the. The, the big the big discussion needs to go. It's great to see, and I've been involved since the European uh, high level expert group and before even involved in many of these uh, discussions at high level in terms of what guidelines, what principles we want to have for AI. In a, in a sense, these principles are easy to agree on. We all would agree that we want AI to be trustworthy, to be fair, to be uh, uh, ensuring privacy, to be transparent and so on. The point, and that's where we do need to take a social technical approach, is to understand and to interpret what do we mean by these concepts? How can we get some type of contextualized, because we cannot have a solution that fits all sides, but how can we contextualize the interpretation of these concepts? And then how can we agree on ways that we can implement these concepts into the uh, value-driven uh, uh, technologies and uh, not only implement them there, but also have meaning to measure and to verify that the systems are indeed aligned with the values that we have or the interpretations of the values that we have agreed on. So the, the main issue at this moment, and I think that is a, a big task for the international community, is exactly to look at this bridge between the high level principles that we are defining in terms of what we want AI to be, what we want AI not to be, and the ways and the, the possibilities that we have, not only to implement these issues, but also to verify and to create the accountable accountability chains that will require uh, that will be required, such that we all across the world can trust uh, can use this uh, these uh, technologies in a way that we can trust and think that uh, that they are beneficial. Thanks, Virginia. And thanks so much for highlighting this point of the bridge moving away from the high level principles, which often are much easier to agree on than than when we get down. I'm going to let 
Sharad come in here and then I'm going to sort of draw on, on, on others of you to comment because I know it's a live question. Virginia uh, made some excellent points and you know, Virginia, I'm going to pick up on an idea that we had a chance to discuss, uh, which we had a chance to discuss as well. You know, in this whole outcome-based model, if you go to a restaurant and you fall sick, then, you know, we don't know what's really to blame. Is it the canned food that they bought? Is it what the chef did? You know, is that something else that went wrong? Or better still take aviation safety, right? So yeah. there's an investigation which looks at all the ecosystem players to pin down what went wrong and to fix it for the future. Yeah. Now, the yeah. issue yeah. that we have here is that we are dealing with a very volatile system, very, very volatile system. The AI ecosystem of today is very different from what it was a year ago or five years ago. And you can be sure it will be very different five or 10 years later. So we have to model it as a complex adaptive system. And in the complex adaptive system, these liability chains become very important. And our ability to create a regime that can deal with these changing ecosystems becomes very important. And so we need to find a way that these liability chains are able to cross borders because if they don't, you know, then you'll have this situation. One country regulates pornography and merely it moves, you know, the server moves to another country where there's regulatory arbitrage and nothing has in fact changed. So we need to take all of this into account. And what Virginia is saying is so right, but it has to take into account these accountability chains, this kind of a testing, uh, you know, when things go wrong, being able to look at the whole ecosystem, build a stakeholder model so that corrective action can be taken. And it has to be somewhat global in nature in a way that it has never been in the past. That's, said, I think, the nub of yeah. the question, because those models yeah. have often tended to be national in the past. Uh, yeah. Gabriela, you want to come in? Just, just based on the, on, the, on the experience that we have earned in implementing the recommendation on the ethics of AI uh, of UNESCO for the last two years, I have seen a, a shift in the narrative. We come from a world in which we did not regulate these technologies. We left them alone. And, and, and I'm hearing this panel, I'm happy to hear the panel focusing on the human, because that's where we need to go. But the problem here is that we still are looking at the technologies. No, let's chase the technology. Oh, this, you cannot control it because you don't know what is gonna happen because the generative, they do whatever they want. That's not the point. The point is the institutions and the, re and the regulatory frameworks that we need to have. And for example, very simple, we always say, and this is a very, very simple example from the, from the ethics recommendation of UNESCO, human determination. For accountability purposes, of course, you need to have human determination because you're not going to play the computer. How do we do it? Well, don't grant personality to AI developments. And we have it there. Questions very concrete, very, very straightforward. And this is what I'm looking at. How do we learn from each other? And this is the contribution, of course, Amandeep will come with the contribution of the body, but I think this is the contribution of the multilateral settings because we need to, we are so far behind in terms of policies, in terms of institutions. I'm working with the European Union to implement the AI Act, to think about what kind of institution. When you hear the president of the US saying, do we need to have an assessment of products before they are released to the market? Far behind, of course, an ex-ante assessment is like 101. These things are not agreed yet. And we need just to put it there and we have it in the recommendation. I think we just need to move to be very practical in terms of what are the solutions that the institutions need to provide for the technologies to behave well. I'm an economist, I believe in incentives and we can create incentives to have more investments in good AI and to reduce the harms that they can do when they are not well framed. Thanks, Gabriella. I want to know from you, Sedina, how does that sound for an African? Because much of the world that Virginia, uh, Virginia describes centers around those national frameworks, or in the case of the EU, a regional framework. But you highlighted in the beginning of your intervention that some of that capacity in administration and instru uh, institutions doesn't exist. So how do we, how does Africa and African countries and societies bridge that divide? bridge it faster? And how does a global AI framework or governance framework support that effort, if it indeed it does? OK, thank you for the question. Um, I, I want to highlight something uh, uh, from the, um, the governance of AI. There, there are two ways to, to do that. 
uh, it could be driven by by managing risk or driven by uh, pushing opportunities to be uh, yes like a, a SDG or, or 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 something like that. There, there are some examples in our group which uh, pop up every time. It's uh, uh, two example of of regulation. One of the nuclear sector and another for pharmaceutical sector. If we uh, talk about the nuclear sector, where for the governance, we say that there is some countries we have able to do something and something, okay? And in the pharmaceutical sector, this is led uh, mostly by great companies who have uh, a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to do research and development. So they are, they are uh, uh, using uh, the, the governance, the, the, the structure to put uh, their products in the market early and to be able to, to, to provide all, all the world. But in this way, it's more driven by a good because uh, the, the, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical sector is, is, is for good. But in AI, we are, um, we are like the pharmaceutical sector where uh, R&D for uh, big companies, big tech companies are driving the narrative. So they are uh, pushing the, 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 uh, the technology. So the governors came after to regulate or something like that. But in the regulation, we don't, we, we have to be careful so that uh, countries like Africa or something like that, uh, A, uh, uh, I'm switching in French and in my time, could have the, 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 the capability to, to build their own. Uh, like in the, the pharmaceutical sector, you, you could have a, a generic and so, uh, so, something like that, but you could have also uh, uh, technology uh, uh, built by Africa, by the, the, the global south. Because uh, AI, it's a, it's a cycle. It's a, it's a cycle. Then the, 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 the actual uh, AI, uh, narrative it's about a lot of computing a lot of data and so something like that but we never know perhaps there is another way to do ai with less data with less compute and to have more successful result so ai it's uh, it's since uh, 1915 and uh, they change a lot because from uh, the logical uh, perspective to the normal perspective, they, they switch uh, in the way. So uh, I remember uh, it was uh, 20 years ago, I work, uh, when I worked in France, in, uh, in Paris, in a startup, doing machine learning with small data, how to build a uh, good machine learning uh, as a system with small data, so it could be Thank you, Ray, it's a really important point because it gets at this issue that we've heard in some, what are smoke screens? And is one of the smoke screens, the existential threat is another that you need massive levels of compute and there's a third, has it gone too far that we can't even regulate? So those, we need to challenge some of those smoke screens. I have two people who want to come in. Amandeep, I'm just going to, a two finger, I think from you, uh, Anna, and then I'm going to turn to Amandeep. Virginia, I haven't forgotten you and welcome, Nazine. I'm going to bring you in, Villar, too. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on this because um, it's a question of regulation and risks. I mean, we have now an example in the European Union with the AI Act. Maybe we shouldn't uh, forget that. And I think they, in the AI Act in Europe, we had exactly that challenge, I'd say. On the one side, we have this uh, risk-based uh, approach that we say, okay, there are just some categories where we are in a high-risk category. And there, it's not forbidden to use AI, but you have some duties to have transparency, to show what data you have used, whether there is any bias that is expected. So there, you would have to uh, show that you tested the technology due to uh, several things. 
Um, and then there are other categories where you don't have to do uh, much. And there are just a few categories where we say it's not allowed at all, which is about like uh, biometric surveillance and uh, which is uh, about social scoring, things, things like that. Um, and one, uh, another one that is very important in the AI is that that is all only for applications of AI and not for the development of AI. And I think there is another risk because if we regulate, and that is, I think, what you were saying too, if you regulate also the development um, too much, then we will have the risk of having only a few regions in the world where AI systems are developed and uh, uh, other regions of the world, the majority so far, uh, that would just be users of models from, from just a few regions. And uh, for that to avoid, it's really important that you have kind of a smart regulation that allows for really innovation and development of AI, but I think that also checks when it's uh, being applied. Um, and then that is also for the developers an, impo an important information because they know, okay, they can try out different things, but if they want to go to the market, if they want to get their models used in specific areas, then they have to fulfill some uh, transparency or other requirements. And I think um, that is an example where we think in Europe, there's a first step in this direction. And that's definitely something that we should look at a broader level or at, at a global scale, I think. Thank you, Amandeep. Very quickly, I think Saidina really uh, touched on an extremely important point when he spoke about the pharma sector. So today we are retrofitting solutions uh, to a structure that's very inequitable. Uh, you have farm access, you have Gavi, you have Global Fund, you know, to democratize access to um, uh, retro antiretroviral therapy and so on. Uh, and with the COVID crisis, there was this uh, outcry about the inequity in vaccine production and so mRNA facilities in Africa. Now, do we want to go down the same path for AI or do we want to be proactive and make sure that the opportunity is democratized and that we have a diversity of model developing ecosystems which are interoperable, going back to uh, Sharad's point, or we just want to have a few and there is not only a tech and economic aspect to it, there is a cultural diversity, there is a context sensitive, uh, you know, the strength of the data that's going into those models uh, kind of consideration as well. No, that's a great point, and thanks for bringing it up. Virginia, you've been waiting very patiently, and Vilas, I'll bring you in then. Thank oh, you. No problem. Thank you. I, I, there's two points I would like to make. One concerning the, the African issue, or the, the issue of the the, the perceived uh, lack, uh, uh, less of the development in the uh, African and the global south. I think that there is here a great opportunity for leapfrogging the, the, the issues that we have been developing the, in the global north. Is definitely not follow up on what has been experimented and tried out in the global north, but experimenting with new, innovative, novel uh, uh, approaches which really take into account this cultural difference, like uh, Amadip just said. So there is a huge opportunity for all of us to look at what the global south is going to do in terms of regulation, in terms of uh, um, uh, accountability and responsibility for this type of systems. And I would really, I'm looking forward to see what's coming from there because I think that will be a, an example for for the rest of the world as well. The other issue is the issue that Anna raised of the development and the, the regulation of development. I don't think that in the research and development, the issue is regulation. The issue is incentives. How are research and development being done at this moment is by focusing uh, almost 100% on improving the accuracy and optimization of these systems. Uh, today and this week, our colleagues and many uh, many of the top researchers in the world are in New Orleans at New RIPS, and the whole conference and all the thousands of presentations in that conference will basically show they improved 0.5% on whatever they presented last year. And this is how research is being driven at this moment. This is our 
how the large companies are developing the, and driving, driving their research. What we need to do is put the incentives di di differently. It's not just say, great that you improved 0.5% your development, but how much did it cost? How much more computational power did you put on this? Is it justifiable to put 20% more computational power and more energy and so on? and more data in a 0.5% uh, increase of the capabilities of your system, or is that not? Uh, and th these measures, these incentives are nowhere in the research and in the development. And I think that is the, the main uh, driven. And uh, then we indeed, we go into a much, much more opportunities to explore, like uh, Zadin just said. So it's not just following up on the, on the trend of more data and more computational power. Power, but exactly exploring different ways to do it in the best, the same way or the, the same capabilities with much less data, much less power and so on. So it's incentives, it's not regulations. Thanks. Thanks very much, Virginia. Theme coming out here. Abhishek, would you like to join us uh, on the desk? We're, we're... Please, please, we'll leave you have a last word, but I'm just going to bring in now Yes, we'll be come seat and we'll have a we'll 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 give you a word should you wish to come in. Um Vilas, you wanted to come in on that. Did you want to come in? Okay. I'm going to welcome Nazneem. It's great to to have you join us and thank you for getting up at such an early hour uh where you're based. Uh you're also a member of the advisory body. Uh Nazneem, I'm going to throw to you a, a question which I hope um may kick off any comments here if there are others. We hear a lot about the multi-stakeholder. We hear a lot about the multi-stakeholder dimension and why a global AI governance framework not only needs, needs to be global and interoperable, but also needs to reflect the full diversity of societies and the range of experts in that. But I'm struck by how many of the conversations tend to turn around regulation and regulatory institutions capacities and the big tech corporations. And what's interesting about AI is we're approaching the question of the governance of this technology in an already fairly consolidated industry. That was not the case in perhaps some of the early days of internet or social media platforms. What is the role of the technical community in this space? What is the role of civil society voices of something that I think has come up here, but we really need to keep a focus on? public interest institutions, tertiary, uh, academic uh, research institutions, applied policy institutions, worlds at regional and national level. Are you seeing still space for those groups or is it harder and harder to get a, 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 a voice in this dialogue? Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I actually prepared a one slide to on this topic. So if I am allowed to share this, I'm happy to. It wasn't pre-planned, guys. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just had the topic of the uh, the room. Uh, but essentially, the way I want to think about uh, global cooperation and multi-stakeholders and the question that you brought in is in terms of like, you know, this three high level artifacts, that is the data, the models and the benchmarks. Um, and um, essentially like, you know, each of these have um, certain categories of like, you know, how we need to like think about them in terms of the question that you asked. And so in particular for data, it would be interoperability. And we, I think a lot of people have like, you know, brought up this point, which is that um, data policy is essentially a, a patchwork or a very, very, very high variance across different countries. And um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's some of these, uh, uh, you know, the stakeholders need to think about like, how is it, how would data go across borders in a privacy preserving way. So if you are, you know, into like data sharing and if we like decide as globally um, to like, you know, basically allow data to pass across borders, especially given, you know, these different restrictions, then um, how do we do that in a privacy preserving way? And more importantly, how do we represent um, diverse voices, opinions, as well as languages in our AI models? Um, and the thing that I wanted to like highlight this is because 
a lot of the languages um, are not uh, very high resource. Many of them are very low resource languages. Um, and a lot of them, even when they have a lot of uh, millions of people speaking the language, they are very much in an oral form. So they're not digitized. Um, and so to think about how does data get from this oral form to digitization, hence get represented in AI, is also like a big gap that still needs to be covered over there. A lot of the tooling right now, especially here in the Silicon Valley, has been focused on curation of data for English-speaking crowd. And so that's, that's a point that I wanted to just really bring up. The second artifact is a uh, the models and so thinking about uh, shared infra and I think uh, um, I'm sure may, many people must have talked about this as to like you know infra is a big bottleneck in uh, training these AI models and so thinking about how do we like have shared infra especially with the global south um, and the th and the other thing about models is auditability I feel this is extremely important um, and also a big question part of the question that you raise is that um, how do we allow safe auditability by third party organization and um, for, so auditability would include not just models, but also the data uh, that the model was trained on. Um, and finally, one critical thing that I believe uh, for educating the masses and democratizing AI is safely open sourcing some of these AI models so that the people themselves not just like you know have the right to scrutinize the models that are out there, but also train their own models and um, yeah, basically customize and govern the models. Um, and finally, in terms of the benchmarks, I would like to think about it in terms of um, you know shared testing efforts. Uh, I think there are there's been some of this um, at least here in the U.S. with you know the DEF CON event where a bunch of hackers got together to uh, red team some of these models, including both closed as well as open source models. I feel there should I believe there should be a more more of these, especially um, from different regions as well. And given everyone's like, you know, different culture, what is appropriate and not appropriate in those cultures. Um, and the second thing, which I think is also like very critical, uh, is uh, incident sharing database. So something goes wrong, example, like the log 4J vulnerability, it affected millions of computers. And I believe that AI is way more powerful and we need to have a way to safely share incidents, maybe even anonymously if someone comes across it, uh, like a bug bounty program or something like that. Um, and then shared across all these three different architecture is a very important incentive structure for this kind of global cooperation across these different um, three art artifacts, as well as like governance across these three artifacts that are out there. So yeah, I just wanted to raise these points and put that out there. Thank you. That's great, Nesni, not least because you brought in the dimension of regional and regional frameworks that can be one way of of linking the global down to the implementation at national, local level, and particularly regional frameworks that respect and, and can interact with cultural and social norms and frameworks. Vilas, you want to add? Thank you. I, I want to bring us back to this very generous audience that's in the room here and online engaging with us. And I want to share with you what you are hearing from us here on this panel is actually an incredible reflection of the diversity of the topics that we're covering at the high level body. And rather than kind of focus on the breadth of it and the amorphous nature, I want to actually ground us in two certain things that I think have come out of this panel. The first, perhaps with deep respect, I'll say, is something I disagree with you on, which is you gave us a frame that said, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've had two men, one to technology companies to build for, you know, profit for outcome. I agree with you there. The second you said, though, is that we also asked society to step in and make sure that we were promoting the positive applications. And there I disagree with you. I don't think we ever named that mandate. In this moment, we have an opportunity to come back and reevaluate whether we can find a consensus-based approach that says this is not a question about how technology companies build technologies, but rather about how humanity builds human institutions and human decisions about how these technologies will be deployed. If that's the start of a certainty, that can take us to a place that leads to an entirely different decision. The second certainty that I'd like to share with you is this. Public discourse has a way of inertia, that early conversations take on extreme weight. The conversation about existential risk, and I'll name it quite specifically, is one that came from a very small cohort of particularly well-resourced voices. It's taken on outside space in the public discourse, 
And we've seen over just the last six months, the new normalization rationalization that says, wait, instead of thinking about 30 year risks that are you know, somewhere in the future, what we should be thinking about is the decisions we can make now that lead to a better set of short term outcomes and lay the framework for that long term vision for us that you spoke to so optimistically, one where society makes decisions for all of us. Those two certainties, and I'm almost done here, can in some ways guide a multilateral conversation that starts from values, principles, and norms that brings ethics into that wonderful framework that Nazim, Nazim just presented and sits at the base of a technical conversation, a technical governance conversation, and then a human governance conversation. That's a great point, and it proves why, Vilas, you're on the advisory body. I know that we have to, to wrap up now, so literally 10 seconds, and you can't engage, seconds. and then I'm going to give the final word to Ahmed. I actually, I don't disagree. I, I'm glad you bring this up, and I'll just share a secret with you, if I may, right? Yeah, because 10 years ago, we started on this journey called India Study. There was no concept, there was no belief that it could actually become meaningful. And this whole notion of DPIs is now mainstream, not just in India, but across the world. Uh, and what's made this possible is just three simple words. Sell to Abhishek here the idea of inclusion. The policymaker wants inclusion. You heard Nazim talked about democratization. You heard her. Sell to the technologist democratization of technology. They love it. And sell to the market, market expansion. If you can do this around a common set of principles that you talked about, you can actually bring all the three together on the same table without having any power. We are just no greed, no glory volunteers. We don't have any power in the system. And so that is what we have to now elevate to a repeatable model. Uh, when we come to AI so I actually agree thank you thank you and 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 for bringing in that practical example Amandeep we're we're closing nearing the close and I know that everybody needs to go out to the dinner Abhishek you you want to come in I'll leave you give a final word but Abhishek should do it but I'll just say what Sharad just pointed out that's the task of diplomats <laughs> yeah. Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar so different incentives and Nazni's points point about the incentive structure also talks to these kind of cults that we have today. Now, there's not only that, there's another cult it's coming out very clearly. So some of these are more hidden, some of these are. But I think this is this is what this what you've heard today, really the kind of task that the advisory body is engaged in, how vital it is, how important it is, how timely it is. You know, what Anna said, you know, very eloquently, this is a network approach. There are different nodes. GPI will be an important note in the kind of future international governance we want. But this would mean that all of these institutions would have to step up. There would be a refreshing required, you know, going from version one to version two. Uh, and then someone needs to step up to make sure that they work together and there is a common basis um, in terms of norms, values, incentives, et cetera. And it's, at the end of the day, it's about us as humans, our organization as societies and polities and into uh, these markets that sometimes tend to bedazzle us a little too much. I think what Gas uh, Gariella also mentioned, that sense of being able to respond, uh, to monitor, review, adapt, and respond requires a, a degree of coherence and interaction. Abhishek, you really do have the last word, uh, and so over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, sorry, I missed the interesting discussion with such high uh, profile panelists who are at the cutting edge of all the discourse internationally with, our, with regard to artificial intelligence and many more things. All that I would like to say is that sometimes, uh, sometimes when we kind of uh, take things at, in large forums, if we have a very unwieldy group in which we start discussing things, then we, we, are, if not, we, we continue to remain at a 38,000 feet level in which we identify all the issues, all the challenges, all the problems, and then it becomes so unwieldy that we are not able to move forward. So what, when we look at the, the, for example, our experience of implementation of DPIs, we always felt that what is the common minimum that we need to do, which will transform lives of people? How do we do that? And how do we come to that, uh, that uh, consensus with regard to what is needed to be done? So that we come down from 38,000 feet to ground and are able to actually execute something. 
So maybe with all this discourse, in fact, over the last two days, we have been having all these discussions with regard to regulation, with regard to risks, with regard to what needs to be done, what needs not to be done, in what ways we can bring out consensus in various bodies. At Bletchley, it was discussed, the G7 Hiroshima process is being discussed, the UN advisory group will surely come out with, with a report doing that. But can we, like, together think of uh, maybe identifying a few low-risk AI solutions or models that can be scaled up, that can be deployed across the world? Like we have come out in the uh, one of the G20 outcomes for setting up a DPI repository. So can we think of AI solutions repository which are known to be low risk, which are known to be uh, uh, solve problems in healthcare or agriculture or education or skilling, and maybe share it with the global south and deploy it? Because many of the countries who are not part of many of these discussion tables, they get lost. They don't know whether it, uh, in what way they will benefit or what harm may happen. So that's one that I would see if this forum can think of creating a mechanism for doing this. The second is the the access to to AI technologies, whether it's data sets, whether it's compute, whether it's uh, algorithms, that is again restricted to a few corporations and a few countries. Can we democratize this? How do we do that? In fact, one of the agendas, one of the theme priorities which got approved today in our GPA Ministerial Council is to set up a collaborative AI for global partnership. So can we kind of bring it together a consensus in which we take this discourse forward and we come out with model guidelines, model rules which the world could adopt? Uh, and then also create an institutional mechanism to take up implementation of these projects. Again, an example comes from the DPI story, the G20 declaration, which talked about the One Future Alliance, but then ultimately it has been actioned by India by setting up the Social Impact Fund with an initial contribution of India for $25 million. And it's open for contribution for other multilateral bodies, other countries, other foundations, and do that. And, and then take up the actual implementation of DPI in various countries. So can we think of similar models for AI, wherein we come up with templates for implementation of AI-based solutions, we come up with templates of guidelines, rules, mm -hmm. regulations that all countries could adopt. And it can be initially at the minimum level, and we can slowly make the good better, but let's go ahead with the good and try to bring on some consensus in that. And the UN advisory body can do that, nothing like it. Thank you. That's a good challenge for the advisory bodies will go forward. And I'll just draw two points from what I think what you said is one, the buy-in of states and of societies and corporations in any forms of global AI governance can, is requires a practical dimension and a component. It can't just sit at the principles. And second, what I took from your statement is we need a progressive approach. We can't wait for the, the, the beautiful model to be there before we start rolling some of these things out. So how can we think progressively and practically oriented as you do. Happily, I think the Secretary General told the advisory board more or less the same sorts of sets of questions with that practical outcome focus. Um, what the members of the advisory board didn't say in, in their discussions today, uh, all or five, six of them today here, is how hard they're working. They had their first in-person meeting today. They were only established in October. Last week they met in person. And by December, they're going to be delivering their first report. So let me just thank them for raising so capably the, the, the range of issues. Uh, thank our, our GPAI colleagues. It's great to have you here, Anna and Abhishek. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Gabriella for, has had to leave. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to have questions, but I would just say that's your food for thought over hopefully food this evening. And uh, thank you for joining us.